Welcome to the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation CF Education Day webcast, Lung Transplantation, Risks, Benefits, and Care. I'm Leslie Hazel, Director of Patient Resources at the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation. This webcast is hosted by the Foundation and supported through an unrestricted educational grant from Genentech. To hear other webcasts related to lung transplantation and CF, please watch an archived one on the Foundation's website. Today we are talking with Dr. Joe Paluski about the risks, benefits, and care related to lung transplantation. Joe is the co-director of the CF Adult Program, the medical director of the Lung Transplant Program, and an associate professor of medicine and pediatrics at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. Joe's been working with people with cystic fibrosis for over 20 years and has been helping in lung transplantation since 1994. So welcome, Joe. Thanks very much, Leslie. Let me ask the first and the most obvious question. What are the benefits of, for lung transplantation for a person with cystic fibrosis? Uh, lung transplant really offers two major benefits to patients. Uh, the first benefit is an improved quality of life. So as you know and have talked about in other webcasts, there have the patients with, with cystic fibrosis do not undergo transplantation until they have very advanced lung disease and a limited quality of life. So they have uh, severe obstructive lung disease and uh, become limited in their daily activities. So transplantation provides an opportunity to obtain much better lung function and an improved quality of life. The uh, oh, second benefit really is survival. So uh, transplant, as we'll talk about in detail, ha has a number of risks associated with it. So we don't jump into transplant prematurely. Uh, we want to wait until patients have a clear survival benefit because uh, the last thing we want to do is shorten people's lives. So I'm an adult with CF. I've come to you. I'm talking to you about transplantation. What are you going to tell me are the differences in my lung care when I still have CF in my lungs and after I've gotten my new lungs? What's the difference? Well, the mainstays of care before transplant include airway clearance, things like the chest vest, the flutter, chest PT, the acapella, and a variety of aerosols, including drugs like pulmazyme and hypertonic saline and, and aerosolized antibiotics. Those are critical prior to transplant. After transplant, the need for the majority of those aerosols goes away. Mm -hmm. So commonly patients will be on some aerosolized drugs early after transplant, but once the lung heals and recovers, we try to stop those drugs and minimize the extra burden of care associated with using them. Wow, so that's all of a sudden they've got this time back because they don't have to do all those aerosolized meds. Well, let's look at it a little bit differently. Um, what should a person with CF expect after trung lung transplantation? Will they have immediate normal breathing? Will they be back at 100% for their lung function? That's a very interesting question because we think of, of transplantation as taking a completely normal lung from a donor and placing it into an individual, and we have this hope that it will work immediately. Well, mm -hmm. in reality, one of the risks after transplant is that the lung doesn't work so well, that in the process of the surgery of taking an organ from one person to another, the lung becomes damaged. That damage is typically reversible so that early after transplant, most patients have relatively low lung function. Um, many patients will take six to 12 months for that lung to completely heal and for them to maintain their maximal lung function. So it's clearly a process that mm -hmm. patients go through a major surgery, have organs implanted, and then those organs have to recover over weeks to months to really be optimally functional. Will, they, will these transplanted lungs be at 100% FEV1% predicted? It's highly variable. Uh, the majority of patients will have a significant improvement in lung function after transplant. Mm -hmm. Many of them will achieve normal lung function, but it varies based on a, a variety of factors. Okay. Well, let's talk a little bit about um, pre-transplant and risks. So mm -hmm. the adult with CF, they've been listed. Um, what are the risks that they encounter as they wait for the call to get their new lungs? I think there are, there are several risks. Uh, one is the emotional risk. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting, I find that patients as they go through the evaluation process have a certain level of anxiety about whether this is right for me. 
are the risks and benefits such mm -hmm. that I should have a transplant? Then they make the decision and the decision is made to go on the list. And then they have this added anxiety, if you will, about the unknown of when it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. So there's a bit of anxiety and emotional challenge that, that goes into that waiting process. Mm -hmm. Because patients know that that call could come at any time, meaning in a day, a month, a week, uh, a year. Mm -hmm. So there's the emotional cost. The second major risk is that of the disease progressing. So we list patients for transplant when their disease is quite advanced. And, and if the usual care is not maintained after listing, uh, patients may suffer a, a real dramatic decline in lung function. Mm -hmm. So there's that risk of knowing that, that if the disease progresses too quickly before organs are obtained, that patients may die before they have the opportunity for transplant. So what can a person with CF do to minimize those risks before they get their transplant? What, what can they do? Sure. There, are, there are several key things. One is, is maintaining very close care with their local CF center mm -hmm. and, and receiving the best possible medical care. Going on the transplant list does not mean that you stop the airway clearance and aerosols, nutritional supplements, and all the other things that go into mm -hmm. routine CF care. The second major thing is to really ma maximize nutrition. We know that with any major surgery, patients tend to lose weight. So we like patients to go to transplant with as good a nutritional mm -hmm. status as possible. The last thing has to do with muscle function. We want patients to be well conditioned. When breathing is difficult, that's very hard to do. It takes a lot of energy to go exercise mm -hmm. when you're short of breath. But we ask patients to do that in the form of pulmonary rehabilitation, where they go to a center on a routine basis mm -hmm. and they're coached in exercise that can be done safely and help maintain their, their muscle function and strength. Okay, so we've talked about pre-transplant. Now, a person has gone in, they've gotten their new lungs, they're still in the hospital. What are the risks that they may encounter there and what can they do to lessen those risks while in the hospital? Uh, the, the risks after transplant, I mentioned weight, weight loss, so mm -hmm. nutritional advancement is a problem after transplant, so eating well and trying to maintain that is important after transplant. The, the major risks associated with the, the surgery are a risk of wound infections. Mm -hmm. Those are very rare nowadays. There are risks of, of developing an infection, pneumonia in the transplanted lung. For that reason, we use inhaled antibiotics very aggressively after transplant. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then there's a risk of rejection that unfortunately begins very early after transplant. The best that patients can do to minimize those risks is to get mobilized early after transplant. That means get out of bed as, much, as hard as it may be with mm -hmm. wounds and with uh, tubes in the chest. Uh, getting out of bed and moving and walking are very important. The other risks, unfortunately, are risks that patients can't control. Mm -hmm. Those are risks associated with the procedure itself. Mm -hmm. Um, so there again, the importance of nutrition and having good strong muscles pre-transplant will help during the hospital risks and hopefully to lessen those. Now let's go to their discharge from the hospital. What are the risks that they encounter, say, in the first year post-transplant? The, the major risks after transplant in the first year and even beyond are infection mm -hmm. and rejection. Uh, those are by far the, the, the biggest problems early after transplant. As a result of that, most centers uh, follow patients very closely with weekly to monthly visits mm -hmm. in the early post-transplant period. And then as things evolve and patients are, are improving, that frequency will lessen. Uh, the point of those visits is to obtain lung function tests and also mm -hmm. to, to do what we call surveillance. Mm -hmm. That is testing focused on infection and rejection to try and identify them early. Well, let, you talked about two things. I want to delve in a little mm -hmm. bit more to both of them. Let's look at rejection first. I've heard about acute rejection and chronic rejection. So what's the difference between the two and what can a person with CF um, do who's had lung transplantation to mm -hmm. help minimize that? The, the common <coughs> mechanism in rejection, both acute and chronic, it, we think is the immune system recognizing that lung as mm -hmm. being foreign. Mm -hmm. So the mechanism is the same, but the way that manifests itself, the way that presents is different. So in, in acute rejection, 
we see uh, cells go into the lung and they cause the lung to function poorly in, in some circumstances, or in some cases it can be asymptomatic, that mm -hmm. is, without any symptoms. So acute rejection is a process that tends to occur early after transplant mm -hmm. um, and, and can occur really um, without, without symptoms. Mm -hmm. So we use bronchoscopy, that is a procedure where we're able to take small biopsies of the lung as one way to identify early acute rejection. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes patients will have symptoms of acute rejection. They'll have cough, they'll have shortness of breath. Uh, most patients will monitor their lung function tests at home mm -hmm. as a way to detect early acute rejection. If we contrast that with chronic rejection, the major, major finding there is a drop in lung function. That's really the best test to identify chronic rejection. Mm -hmm. In this process, what tends to happen is that the small airways in the lung uh, become damaged. They become obliterated is the more formal word. And as a result of that, uh, the airways become narrowed and it becomes harder to breathe. Mm -hmm. That's best detected by lung function testing. So we use bronchoscopy early after transplant to detect acute rejection, mm -hmm. and we rely more heavily on pulmonary function testing to detect chronic rejection. So um, are there any medications to help control rejection, acute or chronic? The lung transplant and all other organ transplants are really made possible by immunosuppressive drugs. Mm -hmm. These are medications that have evolved and, and have been developed uh, specifically to prevent the recipient's immune system from recognizing that organ as being foreign. Mm -hmm. uh, so those drugs are critical. They are life-saving and, and allow transplant to become the benefit that it is. Uh, so taking those medications ri rigorously, that is the same time every day, uh, getting the drug levels monitored, mm -hmm. uh, working with the transplant team, uh, to make sure that that level of immunosuppression is not too high, such that the infection risk goes up, or too low, mm -hmm. such that the rejection risk goes up is very important, and is probably the major thing that patients can do to prevent developing rejection. So it sounds like the timing and care of taking the immunosuppressant drugs for a person with CF is more stringent than what a number of the CF drugs are where there's a little bit of flexibility. So this, this very specific timing, because you said at the same time of the day for their drugs, mm -hmm. is that true? It is true. Okay, uh, that's, I think that's good to know. We want to monitor the drug levels and keep them within a very narrow range because the toxicities of the drugs increases if you have the levels too high. Mm -hmm. And if the levels are too low, you're going to be susceptible to getting rejection. So what happens, what are the complications if these drug levels uh, to prevent rejection get too high? Yeah, the major one acutely, mm -hmm. that is in the short term, is problems with kidney function. So if those drug levels go too high, the, the kidneys become damaged and can in, in some circumstances fail. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the other risks of, of most of the immunosuppressive drugs, the, the, the most powerful ones, are that if those levels are too high, there's a risk of, of seizure. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, so those are, are risks that, that have to be prevented and as, as best we can. Are there any other risks related to the immunosuppressant drugs or those are pretty much all that are watched for? No, we, we watch for toxicity in a lot of different organs. So mm -hmm. the, I mentioned the kidney and the nervous system as being the, the two most common uh, with, with the, the uh, major immunosuppressive mm -hmm. drugs. Um, diabetes occurs v very commonly in CF patients after transplant if they don't have it beforehand. Mm -hmm. That's unfortunately a direct result of the immunosuppressive drugs. They tend to cause diabetes. A high blood pressure is a common mm -hmm. side effect of the immunosuppressive drugs and typically has to be treated. Uh, when we think about longer term risks, uh, the major risks are, are of cancer, mm -hmm. uh, particularly uh, of the skin, and uh, as I mentioned, a kidney failure that can be developed as a chronic problem that REM would require dialysis. So let's go back to, you were talking post-transplant, the risks not only of rejection, but also of infection. We are talking about people with CF. Um, is there a risk for a person with CF who's had a lung transplant, who can they still spread 
CF specific germs to other people with CF or can they get those CF specific germs from other people with CF and can they damage their lungs? Uh, unfortunately, those infection risks don't go away with transplant. Uh, when, we, when we perform transplant, the lungs are replaced, but the sinuses mm -hmm. uh, in CF, which we know have bacteria in them in most patients, those bacteria remain and they can be transmitted to other patients. Uh, similarly, the, the lungs of a patient who's received a transplant, particularly with the immunosuppressive drugs, can become infected, uh, particularly with viruses that one might obtain from other individuals. Mm -hmm. So using very good infection control is yet an, another thing that I failed to mention that, that patients can use to help keep themselves well. So hand hygiene, washing hands, wearing a mask, in certain seasons of the year or in certain situations where the exposures to the air may pose risk, uh, those are critically important. Or avoiding people who have a cold or an upper respiratory infection or people who are sick to, to help them out. So let me ask one last question, and that is, what is the key information that a person with CF should know about the risks, benefits, and care related to lung transplantation? Uh, I think that's a, an excellent take home. Um, I think the major thing that patients need to remember about transplant is that you're trading one set of problems mm -hmm. for another set of problems and making a number of sacrifices when you go through transplant. Go through major surgery, mm -hmm. have to take medications that s sustain or protect you forever, we hope. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a trade-off. It's a trade-off of uh, one disease, that is the cystic fibrosis lung disease, and lung transplantation and its complications. It's, a, it's a, an investment that patients make, and I think when they take that and make that investment and do it well, work closely with their care teams, they will oftentimes derive improved quality of life and uh, improved survival uh, compared to patients who decide not to undergo transplant. So this is really a team effort, as with everything with CF, in making the decision and working through the whole transplant process and then the care post-transplant. Yes, partnering with the healthcare team is critical, both before and after transplant. And fortunately, most cystic fibrosis patients have done that well for, for mm -hmm. years to decades. They, they know how to navigate the healthcare system. Uh, and in many ways, they're at an, an advantage compared mm -hmm. to patients with other diseases. So, well, thank you, Joe, for giving us some great information about lung transplantation, the risks, the benefits, and care. You can learn more about lung transplantation on the CF Foundation's website under Treatments, subsection Lung Transplantation. This section has additional resources about organ donation, transplantation, and financial assistance. It can also help give you some general information and some ideas of questions that you might be able to ask your CF care team and a transplant center so you can learn more about what you need to think about and consider if you want to have a lung transplantation, transplant. You can also watch the other webcasts related to transplantation in the respiratory section. Hear an adult with CF who's had a transplant. Learn what's involved in the evaluation process and hear what things people should consider if they're thinking about lung transplantation. I also encourage you to watch any of the other archived webcasts related to nutrition, CF-related diabetes, insurance, infection control, lung health, lung disease, and more. This concludes the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation CF Education Day webcast, Lung Transplantation, Risks, Benefits, and Care. I would like to thank you for watching, Joe for helping to answer the questions, Rick Baston, the technical crew, Melissa Chin, Genentech for their unrestricted educational grant, and the CF Foundation for making this broadcast possible. Thank you.